Alrighty then, hey guys, what's up? It is quarantine season here with my quarantine beard, my quarantine regrowth, with my quarantine track pants and quarantine t-shirt on. So, we're all stuck in at home, let's get stuck into a video here. So, we'll be moving on to making the jerkin, which is the leather vest part of the manticore armour. Now, this piece is really, really complicated. So we'll be looking at making part one of the jerkin in this video, which is going to be as far as the construction of the panels and getting all of the main structural components together. We will go into the finishing, so all of the hems, all of the detail, all of the like buckles and, and little flourishes we'll be going into in part two. This is pretty involved and there's kind of a lot and I didn't want to skimp over too much, but I will let you guys be the judge. Regardless, let's get right into the construction. So I just thought I'd film a little bit while I was um, homesick from work, so if I sound like shit then apologies. Basically I haven't been, I haven't been filming a lot of the processes as that I've been going through. <laughs> for patterning and the first thing I tried was a complete failure that was just kind of draping over a mannequin. The second one's been more of a success and I'm happy with the pattern that I've got. Um, but I thought I would just do a little quick video to show you my mate here. So I'm pretty happy with the patterning that we've done. You can see that we've got the panels for the jerkin, the little circular detail in the middle. And then we've also got the little piece that goes over the shoulder. And as you can see, that sort of, uh, that, that little bib it does have a seam running up the middle of the back of it in the game, but I believe that it's all meant to be one piece, and that's what we've got here. The whole thing is one piece. And if you are in game and you position the camera above girl, you can see that so there's no seam in the shoulder. So if this belt's too thick, we are going to go with this thickness of belt. And the other thing that I've just uh, quickly done a pattern for that I'm quite happy with is the little bottle holster here, here with the, the little uh, strap bits here. Now the cool thing about the duct tape mannequin is just being able to put thumbtacks on it to hold everything together. It really helps with patterning, really helps with figuring out what the fuck I'm doing. Basically now that I've got all of those patterns down, um, oh, I've got a pattern for the little pouch back as well, but now that we've got all of those patterns down, um, what I am going to be doing is just starting to take some of the patterns for the accoutrement and uh, cut those out of leather then tomorrow. Hopefully if I'm well enough I'll be driving up to Birdsall, which um, Australian leather workers, at least on the East Coast, should be very familiar with, but they deserve a shout out nonetheless. And we'll see how all that goes. Anyway.
So one thing that I like to be aware of when I'm doing something like this is time and effort sinks. And what I mean by that is what is a part of this process that if I invest effort up front will save me time and what is a part of this process that if I invest effort into doing it will net me little to no reward. So for example, positioning all of these patterns on the various hides, moving them around, making sure that I'm getting the best coverage, avoiding all of the holes and major imperfections. I don't mind the minor imperfections that much because I think they help sell it, honestly. That's something that is worth spending time on because if you get it wrong, you'll get to the end and realize that you've snookered yourself and you've only got so much hide left over for more pattern than you can reasonably fit onto it and you'll be forced to have some shit inclusions or something like that. Or need to go and buy some more stuff and that's that's wasted money it's wasted materials it's it's just not good practice and it's a lot of heartache when you realize that you fucked it up at that point so that's something that I think is worth spending a lot of time on now another thing conversely is once I do have the pattern and once I do know where on the hide it's going I'll spend a fair bit of time tracing it out but then I want to have a one inch seam allowance around all of these things so that I can do the French seam that I'm planning on doing later does it need to be exactly one inch. Do I need to go around that? Do I need to buy one of those special little sewing jigs and hook a pen up to that and trace exactly one inch around? Do I need to torture myself getting a ruler and a tape measure going the whole way around? No, I don't think it's that important. I think that you can freehand it. If you put a few marks, these are all weird curves anyway. There are very few straight lines on this. I think that's fine. I, I think that is a time and effort sink to worry too much about that sort of thing. But We'll see how it comes out in the end. I might prove myself wrong. I don't know how to end this segment. Okay, so the tripod that I was using for my phone to film all of this shit broke. So you're getting selfie vision at the moment. But what we are up to is dyeing the leather. So we've cut everything out. If you look on the reverse side, you can see we've marked the seam allowance for the French seam that we're gonna do. So that's why one of these has a hole in it, if you can see that. It's important when you're dyeing leather, or anything really, to do a test first, and especially with leather, because every hide is different, right? Um, and I know that this was like four different hides, but whatever. It's leather that I'm unfamiliar with, I haven't worked with it before, and so it's important that when you do your dye test to test the piece that you'll be working on. So that's what we have here. I've tested this with the dye that we're gonna be using and then put the Neats Foot Oil on it to finish it to the finish that we are going to be expecting. So, the next step is dye all of this. As before, when we're dyeing the leather, the first thing that I'm gonna do is just get it a little bit damp. So I've just got a sponge going over it uh, with a little bit of water there. You can see the color is changing back almost instantly. So there's not very much moisture in there at all. And I'm just getting my cotton dauber and going around in little spirally patterns there. So once we've gotten some decent coverage, because this is going to be a lined jerkin, I'm just laying it down on some linen that I have and cutting out way too much because I'm not really sure of myself in any of this and I figure it's better to err on the side of caution. Once I had the lining all ironed, I went and had did the conditioning step on the jerkin panels. So I've just got some Neats Foot Oil here uh, in a little caddy because I'm terrible at spilling things everywhere. Got my bit of sponge and I'm basically just giving the whole thing a nice coating. You can see I'm kind of going over it twice here. I just don't want any streaky marks left in it. I'm pretty pedantic about that. So going to be flipping that around and this is the panel that I have a pocket sewn into. I didn't film any of that because I didn't. So going to be just quickly spraying some water on the inside here. Uh, this will just help the contact adhesive that I'm going to be using have something to grip onto. So I'm just using cheap spray adhesive from Amazon. I don't have any particular brand recommendations. Um, this was a uh, 
The first time that I tried to do something like this, so really uh, just spray it on both sides as directed on the can. Leave it to dry for a second till it's nice and tacky and here you can see me awkwardly trying to drape it over. Getting a fold almost caught in it, but then uh, picking it out, flattening it, being happy with the amount of wrinkles that are caught in it and using a little chopping board there to spread it out. Make sure that it's all nice and flat and I've got good contact over the whole thing. At that point, ta-da, can peel it up. You can see the whole piece there. Again, that hole is just gonna become part of the seam, so it's meant to be there, it's okay, but the linen lining is affixed. And here we have the beginnings of one of the many French seams in this project. So off camera, I just ran this through a machine, I know. So what I'm gonna be doing here now is trimming the edge here to a length that is going to be uh, basically good for my purposes. This is gonna be folded over and have a little bit of kangaroo skin put over it. So my one inch seam allowance was very, very large and rather wasteful. So here I'm just marking it so the seam is gonna be nice and even down both sides. This will then be cut. After it's cut, we'll be wet forming it and then folding it open to attach the roux hide down the bottom. But as you can see, this step is mostly just neatening it. Now, because this is one of the side seams, we've kind of got dissimilar shapes stuck together. So you can see it warping and wanting to sit in weird, random, different ways. And if you are doing this yourself, then, you know, just let the leather sit how it wants to sit for whatever operation you're doing. It's quite malleable, especially once it's had the conditioning oil put on it. So you can really get away with kind of just manhandling it and putting it where it needs to be. Like I said, we're going to be wet forming it. So I've gone and gotten a sponge and I'm really soaking this in. I don't want it to reach the main body, but I do want it to go just a little bit beyond the seam that I hit with the sewing machine. This didn't end up making any noticeable water lines on the outside for me. So here you can really see that because this has part of the waste in it, it's really wanting to kick up at the end. So once it's wet, it becomes very malleable. And I'm just using the end of my maul here to kind of tap it out and really get this to fold open. It's important that this sits flat. And it's really quite easy to get this to fold open, not quite along where the seam is. So, I did try and be a little bit careful with this, but I probably could have done better next time. So, I'm kind of just pouring out glue along here. Um, using my Leathercraft cement here, this is, I believe, Oakwood contact cement. Uh, not 100% sure. This was from Birdsall, where I get most of my gear. They are now in Tarran Point, not in Botany. And if you are on the east coast of Australia, I truly cannot recommend them highly enough. They run a number of classes. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way. This is just genuine praise. They have a really excellent range of leather crafting goods and classes. And that's like classes for absolute beginners. That's classes on like boot making. If you're into that sort of thing, that's classes on leather tooling and carving as well. So if you do want to get into this sort of thing, I really recommend them as a place to start. If you can get there in person, I cannot recommend it highly enough. So sticking the Ruskin strip onto there, uh, it takes hold pretty quickly. Again, we're just waiting for the glue to get tacky before I stuck that on there and then really shoving it into the seam with the maul. So then, we're now at a point where the thing is wearable. Um, don't worry about these weird scrunches at the sides. Um, you can see we've got the French seams down each side. And 
Hope you can actually see that. It's all lined properly. You can see the, the little strips of kangaroo hide that we've got going up there. So it's sitting a little bit weird. That's for a couple of reasons. So don't worry about the bunching here. That'll all come out in the wash. At the moment where the seams are is sitting with this really exaggerated V, once we get the seam on the bottom, and curl that up, you can see that that's wanting to sit flared out now rather than bunched in. So the shape will come out fine. The question that I need to tackle now is, do I do this seam? Do I do the, I guess it's called the hem if it's on the edge. Do we hem down here? Do we hem down the bottom? Which part do we do next? And the part that I'm going to attack next is the collar. So you can see, oh, you may not be able to see, but anyway, we've still got all the seam allowances here. That's why it's coming so far out off of my shoulders. These French seams here, I did with a machine. Gasp, shock, horror, the shame, I know. But they're not gonna be visible. The bib is gonna cover all of this. And seriously, why wouldn't I? Now, the collar is just going to go around here. It's going to be another similar French seam on this side, and then we're gonna hem the top edge. So the reason that I wanna do the collar next is because I want to do these hems before I do the hem on the bottom edge, and I want to sort out what's happening with all of these. Also, once we do the collar, we'll be able to fold this away and complete it so that we don't just have weird unstuck edges here. So I'm gonna attack it from the top down. Once the collar is attached to it, I'll be able to get the final size for the little shoulder piece that I keep calling the bib. Cause I mean, really, it's a fucking bib. So yes, the collar is going to be the next thing to be done. And then after that, we will work on the hems and the edges in, I guess the most logical way that I can. But I'm super excited with this. You can see I've got a little, got a little pocket going on on the inside. I'm super, super happy with how this is coming out so far.
Hey guys, so I realized that I did all of the um, all of the shaping of the quilting here off camera and that was um, foolish of me, but you know, these things happen. So at the moment I'm punching holes. I've made an error in my orders of operation. So this bib part, I should have punched all of these holes along here when it was still a separate piece because what I've done already is da 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 stitched it up the back and stitched it around one side of the collar. So this is gonna be awkward to punch. I'm only gonna punch this top layer because where it sits on there is kind of unpredictable. So if you care to know, this is the reason why I didn't care that this French seam was machine sewn because hooray, it's not visible. So that is what I'm going to do. But in order to achieve the quilting, all that I did, this bib piece hasn't been sealed yet. The rest of it has had two coats of Neats Foot Oil put on it. You can kind of see the difference in the sheen in the light. This is a bit darker and more reflective, whereas this is not. And because I haven't sealed it yet, I was able to wet form it. So I literally lay it down on the bench, grabbed a sponge until it was completely soaked through. And then I used this. This I believe is called a shaping tool or a, a bone shaper. My one's made out of plastic, but basically it allows you to just scribe those kinds of lines. And I also used it to flatten the edges. Hang on, let me flip this thing over. So if I fold this back, you can see that this edge along here is lovely and shaped. And what I've done is, remember when we drew the seam allowances on? I've just traced that line and folded it back so that I don't have a raw edge. And the shaper is marvelous for that as well. So when it's wet, you can kind of use the flat side of it and scrape it along like that. So foolish of me not to catch it on camera, but I am trying to get this thing done in a reasonable time frame. So the next step for me is merely just punching all of these holes. All of these need to be done in a four millimeter stitch length, whereas these ones around the side could be done in an eight millimeter stitch length. And just in case anyone is, actually, let me put this on a mannequin. So you can see that the side where we've stitched along the neck is sitting nicely like that's a nice shape it's behaving itself nicely it's following the curve of the arm it's sitting across the back the side that hasn't been stitched yet is pinching in weird areas so as we add more stitches this is going to become more and more structural and it's going to sit more and more the way that it ought to be. So if you are making one of these yourself, don't be discouraged if at first it's kind of shapeless and kind of floppy and sits kind of weird because the more that you stitch on, the more that the shape that you've put into the leather is going to come out. Now, what I did want to say, if you are doing this, the error that I made, because I think that it's just as important to share our errors as it is to share our triumphs, because why would you learn from your own mistakes? Learn from mine, that's way easier. So these lines, running in this direction are described entirely by their relationship to these lines, that being 90 degrees. Now, I thought that these lines were placed arbitrarily as a quilted pattern. So I started from this spot here. I picked my angle, I went out, I picked my line thicknesses, blah, blah, blah. They're not random, don't do it that way. If you are making your own manticore vest, start from the front because these lines are described by their relationship to this seam. They're meant to run parallel. These are meant to be just the same squares as everywhere and then that will go back and you'll end up, they'll just meet randomly at the back but that's fine. So currently this here is the correct distance. This back here is not. It's at an angle. They're triangular. This bit is getting rectangular. Trapezoidal? Rhomboidal? Anyway, if you are planning on making your own, start by describing these lines as parallel to this edge. As for me, I'm just going to plot along and hope that nobody notices in person, unless I find people in person who watch these videos, which let's be real, isn't all that likely. So this is just our little secret. So it's the next morning and it's hot as all hell. So I'm damned if I'm opening the window. So sorry if the lighting is screwed up, but we have got our little capelet slash bib sewn on all the way around the neck and all the way down the back here. So the next step I think is I wanna start from this corner that I've imposed on myself and kind of work out because as you can see, it's wanting to like bunch and shit on the mannequin. So I need to make sure that it is nice and smooth and working out from the established edges is going to be the way to do that.
So let's get into it. So trying to neatly stitch all these lines that I've punched in, they're getting a little bit fucked up at the moment and bulgy, but that'll come out in the wash once we do the perpendicular lines. But basically all I've done is used an awl to poke through the rear layers. And if we go over to the rear, you can see it's a fucking mess. It is a fucking mess. But here's the line that we're sewing at the moment. So currently I'm punching through three layers of goat hide and the layer of kangaroo plus the linen that's sandwiched in there. So it's gonna be messy on this end unless your all work is perfectly perpendicular to the surface, but it's a curvy surface. Like this is a 3D shape. This isn't flat. So we'll see how it comes out. So that brings us to the end of part one. In the next video, we're going to look at things like the hems. So we're going to fix up all around the edge of the armholes. We're going to fix up all of the raw edges down the front, around the bottom, along the collar. So we're going to finish those edges and then we're going to do all of the detail pieces like the um, circle on the front of it, all of the buckles down the front of it, as well as just kind of fixing up some of the things that I left raw. So we'll do all of the finishing touches and then the final reveal in the next video. I really hope that you guys enjoyed watching the steps that I went through to make this. I certainly have made some mistakes along the way. If you're making this or something similar, I hope that you found this to be a useful resource. Otherwise, I hope that you just enjoyed this and it helped to pass the time, possibly while you're cooped up inside. You guys take it easy and I'll see you next time.